everybody to another edition of Dr. Community Chapel. Glad you could join us, either in person or online. Uh, we want to uh, quiet our hearts uh, in prayer for the Lord God. All right, if you would uh, stand with me, we want to uh, begin our worship this morning with number six, Come. Almighty King, number six. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning. And we got some new, two new faces. We got Alan and Kay here from the Gideons. Alan's going to be speaking a little later. You know, we went to a Gideon dinner here a few weeks ago, and we had a speaker who's a Gideon from Japan, which you can imagine. Do you know how many Gideons are in Japan? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he said very, very few, but he brought this, this was a copy of a Western Union telegram that was put out in 1945 by <coughs> Douglas MacArthur. And he wrote this telegram to the Gideons. He said, I have many times publicly stated my firm belief that Christianity offers to Japanese people sure and stable foundation on which to build a democratic nation. Japanese people themselves are becoming increasingly aware of fundamental values of Christian religion and appreciative of its spiritual and moral blessing. Your assistance will be inestimable value. Copies of Holy Scriptures, especially New Testaments, both English and Japanese language versions, are essential for success of Christian movement as basis for study and acceptance of the faith. Japanese texts more in demand and can be read with full comprehension by more people. Your representative is welcome to come to Japan as a missionary to make first-hand survey of the situation. Information is being furnished you by, e by airmail, not email. Airmail will be helpful for your planning. I assure you of my deep appreciation of your interest in spiritual rehabilitation of Japanese people. Douglas MacArthur from Tokyo, Japan. And he, I know, I read some time ago that he later stated that he believes that the Japanese people aren't a mighty Christian nation because of the Christians here didn't didn't go and do at that time because it was such a it was such a need after World War II. But anyway, interesting stuff. Well, okay, um, tomorrow night, uh, Monday night, craft meeting over Mater Hall, Wednesday, the prayer meeting, Friday, August 4th, is family night, so everybody uh, come to family night, it's been such a blessing, we're going over the, the hymns, and the history of the hymns, so it's been such a blessing, Sunday, August 6th, everything starts with Sunday school next Sunday, 1115 communion, um, let's continue to pray, uh, our prayer focus on here, our government, federal, state, local, world leaders, persecuted brethren around the world, and Jeffrey Woodkey. I always look him up, but I, I don't see anything. You've got something here, Martha, about leg injury? Yeah, he's been having some trouble when he got back because of the, the way they kept him as a prisoner. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's continue to pray for him and his family. Our sick, Margie, Diane Curry, Jolie, Roberta, Stella, Kim, Rachel, Ed, Judy, and then Sterling's actually home from the hospital. Yay! Yay. And how, how long have you been? Since October 4th. Wait, October, last year? Yeah. Wow. That's a long time. So let's, uh, let's continue to pray for his recovery and then those with cancer, Jeanette. Tom, um, Mike, Marathon, Don, Susan, college students, Caleb, Josiah, Peter, Elijah. Summer Blitz, Summer Blitz is finished, but God's work continues. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, in your bulletin. It's on the, on the back tells there was 237,395 doors now. And uh, so you think the, these kids were, were loyal. There's 51,812 packets distributed. And Paul, Tom, that was your, uh, the book and, and this other stuff. 43,022 Jewish doors knocked. Um, 123 doors per person per day. And some of the, you read some of these things, you don't know how they did it. Because these guys were, uh, they met with people. They talked with people. So what a, what a blessing to see. So let's continue to pray for there was a total of 15 people saved. So that's, that's 
just uh, wonderful. You can't put a, a price on each one of those. How many of those people are going to tell others about Jesus Christ? Um, let's uh, continue to pray for those those uh, kids, and may they have contact with these people. Those that that saw it. That's another thing is. These people got to hear something many of them they've never heard before. And you think you live in the United States, but but uh, what a blessing. And the word shall not return void. So, okay, well, let's uh, continue to pray for the unsaved loved ones. Outreach, Thomas Sorrow broadcast, good news clubs starting soon. More schools, more worker, real life ministries, mobile dental van, and Whitefields national pastors. And then also, Paul. Paul. Yes. Uh, you had something about the. Uh, yeah. On uh, the third Monday of every month, we have a prayer for Israel meeting, a, a short talk, usually about Israel and prophecy, and then prayer for people involved in Jewish evangelism. And it's on the third Monday of every month. But we were wondering if it were on the third Sunday evening of every month, would there be more people who would be interested in? Uh, coming. So if, if you are, maybe talk with me or Tim Anderson. Uh, Tim runs it. And um, uh, so we can see if it's worth switching or not. Because we don't have a Sunday evening service anymore. That would be the third Sunday of every month. Yes, about seven, 7 in the evening for about an hour and a half. Okay. Sounds good. Yes, Tom. You know, so we always read this verse at the end of each summer place when it's called years. Jeremiah 8.20. Jeremiah 8.20 says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Mm -hmm. So, do it again next year. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't have to end at summer. Let's <coughs> keep going. All right. Yes, Martha. And then uh, this week, the Shankulas are in a couple different areas are doing their migrant ministry. It's only one week. So they're ministering to the Spanish speaking people up there. So we want to remember to pray for them this week as they minister. All right. And the Gideons. Continue to pray for the Gideons. Anybody got anything else? <laughs> If you would uh, stand with me and turn in your hymn books to 578, open my eyes that I may see, 578.
and pastoral purposes. Our Heavenly Father, we're so glad that you opened our eyes to see our need for the Savior, Lord, for, for your mercy and grace, Lord, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We just pray, Lord, help us to, to do the same for others, Lord, as we heard uh, Tom preach this morning. We pray, just help us to be available and usable for you, to, to be willing to get the good news out to uh, those that you lead us to, Lord, that we would just be uh, <clears throat> ready to give an answer. Continue, Lord, to be with our nation that's in great need. We've departed from your ways, that godly foundation where, where on this nation was was founded, Lord. We just pray, help us to humble ourselves, pray, seek your face, turn from our wicked ways that you might hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. Lord, be with those in leadership, Lord, around the world, uh, here in our own nation at all levels, federal, state, local, that they would just be aware that they must give an account to you. Lord, we, we pray uh, that they would have a fear of you, that they would seek your wisdom and, and not fear men, Lord, but that uh, convicted, Lord, we pray by your spirit. We pray, Lord, for persecuted brethren around the world that they would be steadfast in the faith, that even those persecuting them might uh, come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Continue to be with Jeffrey Woodkey, Lord, as he is dealing with different medical issues, Lord, and that you would just lift him up, be with him and his family. Continue to be with our sick, Lord, that they might know your grace that's sufficient, your presence with them, Lord, and that you uh, we have a high priest who's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Continue to be with our college students, Lord, that they would be a witness, that they would be grounded in the truth and not be compromised by false teachings. We thank you for the work of those that were faithful and witnessing during the summer blitz, Lord. We pray as the word was uh, planted as seed, Lord, that it would be watered and bring forth fruit. We thank you for those that were saved and pray that they would grow in you and be discipled and uh, be a witness to many. Continue to be with our unsaved loved ones, bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life. Lord, convict them by your spirit that they would have a godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation. Continue to be with the broadcasts that go forth here from the chapel through Tom and Sarab and continue to be with all the missionaries we support, Lord, and that uh, you would help us to remember them in prayer and to support them financially as you give us the ability, Lord. Continue to be with the Sankulas as they're coming up with this uh, migrant ministry team serving this uh, this week. Lord, all these different <laughs> locations, we pray uh, that the word would go forth and, and change the lives of many. We know it won't return void. And we pray for many opportunities to share the gospel with children and adults and that they would understand and trust in Jesus as their Savior. We pray, Lord, also for the unity and effectiveness of their team and that they will be an encouragement to the churches where they'll be serving. Lord, guide and direct us now. Help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to be listening with ready minds, that we might be transformed by the renewal of our minds and be conformed to the image of your Son. Have your way now, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now our brother's going to share uh, with us from the Word and what the Lord, I trust, is doing through uh, the Gideon ministry. an invitation to be pulpit supply today. I'd rather hear Tom Cantor, I'm sure, but uh, it's a little time out for us to share what God has done to the worldwide ministry that he has blessed for 125 years. If I may, I'd like to start. Now, by the way, I'm Alan Goodmanson, my wife Kay, and, and uh, we've had the privilege of being part of this organization since our youngest was six months old. So that's a few years ago. <laughs> We'll share some of the blessings of that ride. Let's see if I can figure out the best way to read. That looks pretty good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with Romans, the 10th chapter, and read uh, verses 9 through 15 as a stage setter for the remarks this morning. It says, um, 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, praise God, and that reflects the ministries here of this church. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now then, will they call on him in whom they not believe? Well, how are they going to believe in him if they've never heard of him? How are they going to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Amen. Bless his holy name and word. Well, friends, the Gideon ministry is in a perfect alignment with the ministries of your church. I went on your website and looked at some of the summary statements and under emphasis for MVCC, um, I'm quoting here, we are committed to exalting one, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Bible, through prayer, and through missions. And that is a perfect alignment with the Gideon ministry here and around the world. What are the spiritual objectives of our members? We have about seven, but three of them that are primary are that we are men and women of the book, we're men, men and women who pray, and we're men and women who witness. And if we took that to our logical extreme, we're going to touch a lot of people in around our families and in the world around us. We take seriously Jesus' command of, I, of Acts 1.8, when he's charged, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. He doesn't say after, after, after. He says and, and, and. So it's going to take a bunch of us here, there, and everywhere helping to fulfill that great commission. We're men and women who, as Gideons, who are taking the message of the cross outside the church to win the loss, to bring them into the church, to be nourished and build up in the faith and replicate so they will go out as well. And we'll have a, we'll have a signing and swearing in opportunity at the end of the meeting for those of you who are not yet Gideons. Okay, I'm glad you were listening. So where is all this going on? Well, it goes on in Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. Uh, Belarus, how many missionaries do you know there? Not that many. Anyway, we have, for instance, in uh, uh, just in Ukraine, there are 2,050 members of the Gideons who, since the fall of the Iron Curtain, have handed out 46 million copies of God's Word to a population of 44 million. Just one organization on fire for the Lord. So they're doing this to students, prisoners, the military, and also the people hospitalized. And the thing to remember is that these people with boots on the ground are there without visas, language training, culture shock. They have more time than money, which some of us seniors now are experiencing too. But if we get the word to them, their bicycles and motorbikes are on going and going out to the ends of the earth to fulfill that great commission. It's an amazing result just in Ukraine alone. And Ukrainian pastors and through our own organization, we're getting reports of just revivals happening under the horrible, horrible pressures and attacks they're getting from across the border in Russia. Well, in a minute, I'll come back to some other testimonies from countries around the world. But most of people are aware of the Gideons do what? Hotel Bible, right? And so when someone goes to a hotel room now, they pick up a Bible, and they have since 1908 when we started placing them at, yeah, with the permission from the innkeeper. But in the front it says, are you alone, depressed, addicted, stressed, cheated, experiencing conflict or temptation? Are you possibly considering suicide? Are you just curious? Do you need hope, peace, joy, comfort, purpose, forgiveness? You need God? Read on. 
and then a good invitation. Well, travelers are drawn, are drawn to that message, and Tracy did read on. She wrote to the Gideon, she said, I was on a direct path to hell. I was a hardcore drug user. I was active in witchcraft. My soul was lost to Satan, and then I stole your Bible. <laughs> now, God directed me to the verses in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, which said, All who use witchcraft, divination, and consult with spirits are an abomination to God. Well, I didn't think of myself as an abomination. I didn't cheat. I didn't kill. All I did really just stole your Bible. But God, by His Spirit, let me know that's exactly what I was. I read the Bible. It brought me to a crossroads. Who was I going to serve, Jesus or Satan? With only the Bible you place, and I stole, parenthetically, and the Holy Spirit to God guide me. I got on my knees. I repented of my sin. God has done nothing short of wondrous miracles in my life since the day I stole that Bible and began to read it. Well, can we praise God for God that changed life and many others who have found faith in Christ as a result of Bibles purchased by congregations like yours. A woman who identified herself as a jazz singer, and I've seen her testimony uh, on video, said that after many lonely nights and dark rooms that she performed in, she came to know Christ through the Bible that were led, Bibles that were in her hotel room. She says, I just thought I'd remind you and me that the I found out it's the only book where the author shows up when it's being read. Isn't that a great way of looking at it? The author is there while it's being read. God's Word is alive and powerful, Hebrews 4.12. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Bonnie wrote to us and saying that uh, she'd been divorced twice, was seriously considering being divorced a third time, was involved with drugs, and then out of the blue, and we'll call it God's blue as you hear the rest of the story, her husband invited her to go on a business trip. She said, I didn't pack anything to read. I get in this hotel room in the northeast part of the country, and she said, I just opened the book and I was directed to John 3.16. And that so much convicted me and convinced me of God's love that she said, I asked him for his forgiveness. For his forgiveness, I invited Jesus to be my savior. When my husband got back to the room, he didn't know what hit him. She said, I was such a different person. I was not complaining, bitching, moaning, and saying that I wanted a divorce. I was very excited. She says, I want you to know that our marriage has been saved. My husband and I are active now in Christian marriage counseling. Isn't that a redeemed couple there? Praise God. Well, here's some things I can deputize you to do as far as the hotel rooms. Most hotels and hotels remove the Bible from their guest rooms during COVID. So suddenly they either went to a shelf or were trashed. So we are trying to uh, romance and encourage diplomatically managers to get them back in because it is a bit on their part. They have to check for their availability. So when you find a hotel and you get there and you do find the Bible, do let the front desk know. When you get a questionnaire, perhaps by email, say how much that meant to you because that will get multiplied in the minds of the people that are evaluating what direction to go as far as Bibles are concerned. If a Bible is not available, um, go ahead and, and let the people know as well, not in an angry tone, but that just say the better hotels like yours have a Bible. Is there one available for room 125? And let them ask their head of housekeeping to maybe find it, or just say, oh, I'll let my manager know you inquired. We used to have them. There aren't any there now. And that's kind of what we did somewhat recently. So we were at a Gideon leadership meeting up in... Uh, in Orange County, and the general manager wrote us an email after our stay, and I commented that we didn't find a spot to put our suitcase. There was no fold-out suitcase stand. We had to use an ironing board to kind of get to our, our things that we were going to wear. And I also mentioned that there wasn't a Bible. And here's what he said back. Thank you for completing the survey regarding your recent stay on our property. On behalf of the entire team, I'd like to apologize for not exceeding your expectations. Isn't that great? Your satisfaction is important to us. We'll be using your feedback you gave us to implement improvements 
to ensure we offer a better experiences for guests in the future, and he gave his phone number. Call me if you have more things to say. So people are concerned about the service they provide. They're in competition. So go ahead and be involved in those kind of opportunities and uh, let the folks know, and hopefully that'll help us. We also have regular contact with the housekeeping staffs. We check the supply and condition of what we say are our Bibles. We're here to check our Bibles and find the condition. We try to go to a couple rooms with head of housekeeping or the housekeeper on keeper on duty, and we look at their quality. And one lady said to us, I received that little testament from you when you were here last year, placing scriptures. I read it, I found the Lord as my personal savior. I took the same testament, I led my husband and 11, 11 family members to the Lord since last year. So talk about passing the peace of Christ on, my goodness. Locally, when we meet with the housekeepers, we find out how many of them are heart language Spanish speakers, how many are English, and we'll give some of each as, they, as we're directed. Well, uh, let me pivot, pivot with you and let you know that eight out of 10 scriptures given out by Gideon members are, not given, uh, are given to school children around the world, middle school, high school, college. One million copies of God's word a week are going out around the world. Come with me to Indonesia where Yusuf grew up in a Muslim family. He was offered a New Testament at his school as a junior in school. He said, I just took it for a while. He said it was a sec sake of comparison. He, he and his family though just developed a real hatred for the Christian community who had built a church in their small town. And he and his friends, not telling parents, said, you know, I, we want to burn that down. So he said, I went into the, one December I went into the church, found out that actually they were doing some decorating for the Christmas holidays. Didn't want to just leave and rush out, so I kind of helped them out, working with the decoration. <laughs> it got a little bit late, he said, and people decided to sleep at the church, so I said, well, I guess I'll do that too. And you, it's going to sound like a God stood thing story when I get done. You can give applause then. So he uh, he does that. He sleeps there, and at two in the morning, he hears a crackling. He says, "Oh no, the plan got going sooner than me getting back." They were starting to burn the church down. He was there. He helped put out the fire, and he and he said he had no peace in his heart after the fire was done. And he said, I, I compared the hate that I had and that of my friends for the Christian community compared to the love of these church members who brought in a total stranger and uh, enjoyed, he said, I enjoyed my time with them. So he said, I began to read that testament that I was given at school and I was drawn in by John 14, 6, so familiar to us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I accepted Christ into my heart. And now uh, some of you are old enough to remember Paul Harvey, right? You don't have to all identify, but uh, the rest of the story is that he married the young lady he met at the night of the fire. Today he and his wife are the pastors of that church. Oh. <laughs> I love it. Coming back to the United States, and with Scott's help here in a minute, we're going to lower the screen and uh, show you a testimony. Listen to a testimony from Joplin Emerson. He received a testament as he left his high school property. And notice at the end of his testimony how God used the local church and a caring 70-something-year-old member to get him to come back where he finally became convinced of his need for a Savior. So here we go. I'm going to step on down and enjoy this with you. Thanks, John. Here's Joplin. When I was 16 years old, I was leaving the parking lot of my high school in Clearwater, Kansas, a small rural town of about 1,500 people. And as I was exiting, there stood a Gideon, and he handed me this exact copy of God's Word on my way out. 
As I drove away, I was probably that typical teenager that many of you have stood before and placed a Bible in hand at times and thought to yourself, he'll never read it and he'll never do anything with it. And the honest truth is I had no intention whatsoever of ever reading it or ever doing anything with it. I was only 16, but my life had already begun to spiral out of control. I was deeply addicted to drugs and drug use was a normal part of my activities. By the time I was a senior in high school, it's fair to say that as I stand before you and before the Lord, to the best of my recognition, I use drugs every day of high school, before school, during school, and after school. I remember overdosing my senior year at about 8.15 a.m. in the morning, waking up in the nurse's office with people hovering over me, thinking to myself, how did your life get so out of control? But even then, I didn't pick this up. <laughs> Somehow I graduated and continued to do the very thing that was bringing me down. I was selling drugs in a larger capacity, using needles on a regular basis, drinking to blackout stage at night, and there came a time when I was 20 years old, laying in bed after a series of events that had just a horrible evening. And I remember laying there, it was early in the morning and I couldn't go to sleep and I thought to myself, maybe you ought to just kill yourself. I had lost all respect for myself. I had concluded what most of the world had concluded long ago, and that was that this world would be better without people like me. As I sat there and for the first time honestly contemplated killing myself, I cannot tell you why, but the thought occurred to me, what if hell is a real place? I had never been a believer. I had not believed in God. I had not believed in heaven or hell, but I thought, what if hell exists? And I knew if it did, that's where I was going to go. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to prove that this isn't true. And four years after this was placed in my hands, I cannot tell you why I still had it. I cannot tell you how I kept it. But it was there. And I opened it up and I began to read and I just started at the front because I didn't know where else to start. And I only got to page 16 in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 where it says... Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. I read that, and I thought that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because I fall into the category of everyone. And there are no stipulations on what you can ask. And though I had been in a lot of dangerous situations by this stage in my life, I had never prayed. And I knelt and prayed for the first time in my life. And I said, God, if you're even real, if you can even hear me, I'm giving you 30 days to show me yourself. Now, I knew the promise said that I had to seek and I had to knock. And so I tried to do everything that I thought you would do if you were seeking God and I tried to quit doing bad things that supposedly sinners did and I started going to church I knew I couldn't claim I was seeking God and knocking if I wasn't going to church the first two weeks I didn't know where else to go but my hometown and I, I went and it was so cold I was a convicted criminal by the time and people in my town knew who I was but I'll never forget the fact that I was truly seeking God and how rejected I felt at that time. And I decided I'd go somewhere where nobody knew me. And the, next, the third week I went to a church and sat through service. And at the end of service, there was an old lady in her 70s. Her name was Nadine Ledbetter. And she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, son, is this the first time you've ever been here? And I said, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, would you come back? She didn't say anything about my clothing. I had on what was indicative of, of gangster clothing, the baggiest jeans I could find with letters running down the side and a, and a football shirt on and my hair down to my shoulders and a tongue ring in and an earring in. She said nothing about any of it. She just said, would you come back? 
And I remember leaving and thinking, that was odd. Did she not see how I look? But the first person to ever invite me to church was this 72-year-old lady. And I thought, I want to go back. So I went back the next week and I saw a man preach with passion I had never seen before. I could, for the first time in my life, I could tell without any question, this man believes this. You cannot preach with that passion if you don't believe it. And I wasn't ready to agree with him yet, but I was just moved by the fact I knew he believed this. And he walked by me when he was preaching and the best way that I can describe what I saw in the twinkling of his eye was compassion and love and boldness and fire. And when I saw it, something moved in my soul and I said to myself, I don't know what that man has, but I want it. And at that moment, it's the first time in my life I heard God speak. I had forgot that it had been nearly four weeks earlier when I told God that I wanted him to show himself to me in 30 days. I had forgot really why I was there. But at that moment when I said, whatever that man has, I want it. I heard God speak. And here's what he said. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. To him who seeks, he will find. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And I knelt and I prayed and I didn't know the sinner's prayer. All I could say was, I'm sorry. And I said it over and over and over again. And I got up from that altar, a changed, born again man who has never looked back, delivered immediately of drugs and alcohol. And my life was changed in a moment. Since that time, God's called us into the full-time ministry. I pastor a church. We've seen many, many people who could stand and testify to the same life-changing power of Christ that I've experienced in our church. This evening, I want to leave you with this. My life is a product of someone put putting the written word of God in my hand, an older lady showing me the love of God and inviting me back to church, and a preacher preaching the word of God in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you that you're in an eternal business. The ministry of the Gideons is a ministry about souls. Not just changing the world as we know it and not just reaching the world for today, but changing time and eternity. I want to encourage you to never forget the power of God's word to work all by itself. In a moment in my life when I had no Christian parents and no Christian uncles or aunts, and no Christian cousins and no Christian grandparents and no Christian influence whatsoever in my life and nowhere to turn. Thank God that some Gideon stood on a street and put this in my hand as I was driving by at 16 years old. The power of God's word and the power of God's love is enough to get the job done. It bridges all gaps in all ages. And tonight, on behalf of the multitudes who will never have the opportunity to stand before you as I have and tell you their stories, I say thank you. God bless you. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. You are making a difference and it is people like me that make it what you're doing fruitful, beneficial, and this ministry must go on. Thank you and God bless. The opportunities of, me of uh, membership is to go to the international convention that just concluded two weeks ago in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Next year, hey, Phoenix, Arizona. You gotta know somebody whose air conditioner you wanna check over there next July. So I think Kay and I are gonna try and go over because we've got a, he has a brother, I have a sister who live over there in the warmth of uh, our country. Anyway, isn't that a, just a wonderful partnership God put into his word? It is hard convincing him. The 70 year old woman, I mean, who could imagine that being that old? I, I wish. <laughs> anyway, to God be the glory that uh, the cross uh, was planted in his heart. Another student here in the U.S. was offered a testament at school, and he said, no thanks, you gave me one last year. And somehow the Gideon, not quite sure why, said, well, what'd you do with it? He said, well, I took it home, I threw it on our, a table, and he said, I had no intention to read it, but my dad picked it up. He ends up reading the whole thing. He signs his name in the back that he wanted to become a believer, he gave it to my mom. She read it, she did the same thing, and they both told me, you ought to do it. So I read it. And I came to know Christ, and then or my sister did the same thing, and she said, uh, we are all attending, he said, we're all attending church together now. Thanks for giving me the book last year. So to God be the glory. Huh? What a reinforcement that our laborers at school are not in vain. Since we have the leisure of a little time, let me just add a story. I was relatively new Gideon. We were in Berkeley, California. We were at UC Berkeley. And a new man had just joined the Gideons in a nearby Richmond camp, said, I can come out in the afternoon and help you there on Sather Gate with the streams of people moving around. And so as he tells it, the next chapter meeting we had, because I, I didn't actually hear it on the camp, he said, well, I just got there for the shift starting at one o'clock or noon, I can't remember which it was. And then a lady came up to me, a young lady, and said, are you a Gideon? And he said, oh, no. You know, what, what's going to happen? He said, well, I, I am, but he, I think our leader's over there. <laughs> so he deflected. She said, no, 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 no. She said, I just wanted to tell you, I'm an assistant librarian. I was upstairs in the library last year. Somebody threw their testament. They didn't even want it on my counter. I took it home to my little pot of atheist parents and brother to laugh more about these silly things of faith. I just want you to know we've all come to know Christ in the last year. <laughs> And, he, and so this new Gideon of days, weeks, said that my feet were this far off the ground. I was filled with purpose getting that book out. So anyway, that was just this little vignette from somewhere back in time in our lives together. Anyway, we love going to schools like San Diego State University, Cuyamaca, Grossmont College. Had a marvelous experience this spring. We have this phalanx of about eight Muslim garbed females walking down towards the classroom. Remember this, Kay? And I don't know what you were thinking, but I thought, well, I know just enough about the Injil and the Gospel and how Muhammad says it's okay basically to read the Gospels and the, and the Septuagint, the works of Moses. So I'm chatting with them, that sort of thing, and they said, well, um, okay, I'll take one, one of the gals said. And all eight of these women took a copy of God's Word and started reading and going off to different places. I mean, it's that's a God moment because particularly the males are very practiced in saying, I'm good and how nice of you to be here, but I don't want one. But to have eight female Muslims take it, what a, what a glory and what God can maybe achieve through that. Grossmont High School, Hillsdale Middle School, Steam Academy, went to about 15 high schools and uh, middle schools this past year. I think it's about four years ago, we started going as husband and wife teams. And that particularly has a friendly look, I think, to parents, in particular middle schoolers. Our experience is that students have seem very receptive to taking scriptures out of the hands of our wives. All of, and all of us, of course, as members of the Gideons. So we team up when possible. Uh, we typically go to about two schools a month, every other week. And um, talk to Kay if you want to find out some of her experiences. Uh, all right, well, what's another company, a country that's fulfilling the Great Commission? Come with me to India. There are 40,000 members of our association in India. They're in 1,000 cities and towns. They're handing out one and a half million copies of God's Word a month. They're going into the hands of students primarily, but also the hospitalized prisoners and the military. 
They added 50 more towns in the ministry last year. They now hand out more scriptures in the country of India every year, every year than the entire United States Gideon population does. I mean, it's just stunning what God is doing, taking his word to the end of the world. Now here we continue to work with military chaplains as they ask for scriptures being available to them. Mark wrote and she said, I got a scripture when I joined the Navy. It was my first introduction to the Word of God. It caused me to start asking questions that eventually led to my faith in God. Quotes, I say, his letter says, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior 700 feet below the surface in a nuclear-powered submarine. God is able to meet me wherever I was. I'm a new creation, thanks in part to a loving act of a Gideon, a little bit like Joplin's testimony. So dear congregation, that's a letter of praise and a thank you to you for your part over the years with membership and also with your financial support. We're now resuming Bible studies and discussions in our jail environments like Donovan Correctional Facility. One of our Gideons now is not there every Saturday morning at a time we get together for prayer because he's down at Donovan. And they're having good results there. there you realize there are just many, many men in the pastorate today who have been redeemed in prison and while serving their term have gone to seminary or finished their GED, finished their college, finished their seminary, and they're in the pulpits today of our country. Listen to a prison testimony from Pastor Nicanor. It says, I was born in Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico. My mother gave me away when I was six months old. I never knew my biological father. I had no affection or money. I dropped out of school at age 10. By age 12, I was smoking marijuana, drinking alcohol, taking pills, and was drawn into the easy money that came with delivering drugs to others at the request of adults to age. One day I got arrested though, and I was put in prison, and someone tried to tell me about Jesus. My heart was hard, I wasn't interested. So I started going in and out of prisons, and I always returned my own habits. I did receive a New Testament from a visiting Gideon. Didn't read it, but I did start using his pages to roll my cigarettes. And one day, while making a cigarette, I read Revelation 3.20. Wait for it. <laughs> I didn't understand it. I felt sadness because I went ahead and smoked it. Anyway, I was lonely, abandoned, hopeless. I was going to end my life. I went to our bathroom, put a uh, rope around my neck, stood on a pail, was going to take my life. And I heard someone call out to me, Jesus has a different life for you. As I got off of the pail, I looked around, I couldn't find anyone, and went back to my room. I got back to that same scripture, how Jesus says that, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and will open the door, I will come in. I'll eat with him and he with me. I gave my life to Jesus that day in my jail cell. Within six months, I was actively sharing my testimony with other prisoners. Within another six months, I was made co-pastor with a chaplain in the jail. A year later, I was released from prison. And he says, I thank God for the spread of the word of God that has touched lives like mine. I'm now happily married. I'm the father of two. I'm a pastor at Cuernavaca. And uh, I have given my two children a much different life than I had growing up. Isn't that a praise report? Amen. Well, a great uptick we're having in requests for scriptures from hospital uh, chaplains. Grossmont Sharp, in particular, has been really on us to get about 100 scriptures a month to them. They, she, they, they say every scripture, larger print testament, New Testament, that is given out is only given by personal requests of the patient or their family. We aren't just handing them out. And he said when they leave, hopefully, with... Uh, better health, we share, we do share with them, please take this with you because it's going to be discarded after you've left because of our rules that we have regarding handling of, of, of things like the Bible. So a lot of them are going home that might not have in the past. So we're very excited at that and we also are going to the skilled nursing centers in the community. We go as husband-wife teams because we as men aren't going to go in with two women and 
being attended to or whatever, and we men go into what is, tends to be about a third of the rooms, and we offer the scriptures to them as well. Anne wrote to us and said, the verses were so helpful to me in the scriptures. She said, I wasn't coping well. I asked another patient, how are you doing? And she said, I've been reading this Bible, this testament that they gave us there at the front desk. Go to the activities director, I think she'll have one for you. And Anne said, I got it, I started reading it, and uh, hope began to fill my life. I continued to read the word after I got home. I now belong to Jesus. I've never felt so much freedom, peace, and hope. Again, we praise God that his word is alive and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, as it was in Anne's case and the other share of certain testimonies I've shared. Come with me to a Guatemalan uh, hotel where Alberto was a first, uh, patient. He had had his right arm amputated. A Christian nurse had been given a white testament. She saw his kind of hope and despair, said to him, Alberto, this is a comfort possibility for you. Why don't you read it? So Alberto read it, and he started reading and came to Matthew 5.30. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one arm than your whole body going to hell. Well, does think God was in that, that he focused his attention on that? That, la that verse led to Alberto having an amazing transformation. He's now a pastor in Guatemala City, and he shared his testimony with some Gideons who were visiting with him. So it really encourages us to keep doing the things we do. All these testimonies uh, from travelers, the hospitalized, the jail, the schools are only good as God the Holy Spirit draws men and women, boys and girls to an understanding of their need for a Savior. And the invitation and opportunity for them to sign their life over to Christ is inside the back cover of these testaments. They just start out with the basics saying God loves you, you need Him, He will forgive you, you need to accept Him. Choose to follow him. Sign here. Tell Satan to get behind you. Go find the church. So that's what's going on. One recent event was just really amazing to me. We go to the county fairs. And we've heard over the years that we've been here, we moved here from Sacramento about seven years ago, we heard about the L.A. County Fair and the amazing number of scriptures handed out. On one count, I said, how did we ever get enough church support to do that? But Kay and I were part on one day, one four-hour shift. Uh, we get in, rented uh, two weeks of the four-week time as a not-for-profit to have a booth. It was near the arena gate out at Del Mar. And we start handing out testaments. So typically there were three or four of us staffing the booth. We could wander out up to maybe five, eight feet to say, I have a gift of scripture for you. We were amazed, I was personally, how many parents were did not pull their kids back. I mean, it was one in 50. The rest said, okay, honey, if you want to you know, take a souvenir, do whatever, you're welcome to take one. And we're not gonna see all those kids at a, at a school, because they're either after school, went off to a bus to a sporting event or whatever it is. So there we worked, uh, we worked, how would I say, we worked it uh, Wednesday through Sunday, two five-day periods. During that time, this just concluded, July 4th, on which day alone over 2,000 scriptures were received by people coming by the booth. In that two week period, 14,650 scriptures went out. It sounds like your youth blitz time you had this earlier this year, this summer. Anyway, I was amazed. I had heard they were going to try to get as many as 10,000 scriptures collected from all around the various chapters, but 14,650. So, hey folks, the cupboards are kind of bare <laughs> in this area as far as scriptures to go to the youth in our area as we start this fall again. Well, we're organized in 200 countries of the world, but that doesn't get to the end of the world. So what is another thing Gideons are doing? We have a Gideons app. There's a card like this available for everyone as they leave. And anyway, I just checked this week and found out that we now have on that app 1,962 languages of the world in the Bible. 
It goes into 243 countries, which is more than the 200 that we have organized. So we're not the only Bible app. There's many others, and some of you may have them. But anyway, and there's a whole bunch of translations on there in addition to languages. So we're just praising God as another way to reach out to a digital world. I've used that app at a, a Grossmont College to show Arabic on on the site, and they they're kind of oh okay I have to read that. So anyway, God is doing that. We're also offering English or Spanish testaments to drivers and and, pa and passengers in cars lined up to go through church sponsored food bank kind of things. So okay, this Wednesday, Lord willing, and I think weather will easily permit, we'll go down with a little badge on, may I pray for you, and we'll hand out in either Spanish or English at their acceptance, scriptures for them to take with them home. And they will sometimes say, would you pray for me? And we have that opportunity. It's just a sweet thing as these people are at various levels of need for physical uh, nourishment, and now we're helping them with spiritual nourishment. All right, we also are going to be invited to that same church to the VBS graduation ceremony on a Friday, either this next Friday or the one after. Share, share a little bit about the story of Gideon and then hand out personal testaments to the young people there, most of whom are unchurched that are coming to the, to the uh, VBS time. And our wives are very much involved with us, and particularly at medical conventions. The next convention here in town is the convention of the Spinal Cord Injury Annual Conference, the first week of September. So our wives will be there, assisted by our men, moving in white testaments. And there are wonderful interactions with the attendees, whether they're Christians or non-Christians. The Christians are really encouraged to say, oh, I gave mine away just five weeks ago. I'm glad to get another one back, you know, into my, uh, my locker, you might say. We also are, have had a long standing, and you have a display out front that we've refreshed it as I came in today, the Gideon Card Program. And there's just a wonderful way to honor the home going of a family member or friend, send to, the, uh, uh, send to someone who is surviving that loss how much they you revere their life by giving Bibles in their honor. And you'll end up getting short, sweet notes like I'm reading here from Burl. Thank you for your sympathy card for our daughter. Our daughter's life and it was special. It was very appropriate that you would do that. She loved the Lord. She studied God's Word. Thank you for blessing others to remembering our daughter. And that can happen. You may know someone that has a birthday this year. I don't see any hands, but there will be some birthdays, actually. So get, grab a congrats card and just say, hey, congratulations on reaching 60 years of age, 50 years, 80, whatever it is, or even anniversaries, and you just can donate Bibles. So you send the card to somebody honoring what they've done. You take out the envelope and write a check, and it comes to our mailbox, and every dollar you give goes 100% to the... Uh, purchase and the distribution of scriptures. We don't translate it, we don't print them, we have to just buy as any church would co uh, copies of God's Word. They've gone up, the cost of scriptures have gone up for the first time in 50 years. They went from uh, about $1.25 to $1.70-ish in one year. And uh, that's proving to be a challenge. So anyway. Well, I, I think back to when Kay and I joined the Gideons. I was mentioned earlier, our youngest was uh, three months, six months of age. We were at a dinner meeting, and someone had called our church and said, do you have in mind some folks that might want to come to an informational potluck event? And we went, and uh, I just basically asked the man there, and was now in heaven, and I said, well, tell me, you know, the purpose of your organization. Well, he said, the only purpose we have is that we're, we're a, organization whose sole purpose is to win men and women, boys and girls, to Jesus Christ and encourage them to follow him and his teaching. That's it. I said, he said, yeah, all the money we get buys the scriptures. We have no overhead other than our dues. And you can just choose the ministry areas and the time you want to serve and it'd be helpful. So we extend that same encouragement to you all to consider possibly whether you'd like to be part of this 
in, in a part-time ministry area as has blessed our hearts. We meet wonderful people. When we joined, it gave us, we were married and moved out of state from where our parents were, so we had instant grandparents in our lives. It was kind of fun how much they loved on folks like little Caleb going out the door there. Anyway, Isaiah 48, familiar to all of us, right? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Bless his holy name, and thank you all. for uh, sharing. I'm glad uh, you and uh, your uh, wife Kate came and joined us uh, this morning. Be sure to, uh, Dan, you said you have a, a table. Alan. Alan. Did that say, oh, did I say Dan? I'm sorry, Alan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so, Alan, did you say you had a, you have a table in the foyer? We'll stand and answer some questions. Okay. And we have cards there. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So we want to uh, close with him. If you would uh, stand and turn in your Bibles to eight zero seven eight zero seven. Hey Ken, I, I just want to remind everybody that Pastor Jim <coughs> during World War II would say that in the Bible, and um, Sam. <laughs> and uh, Jose Ornelas, with his in, uh, first introduction to the Gospels with, through uh, a get in the Bible. Yeah. All right. So if you would stand with me and turn uh, to 807, go ye into all the world. 807.
for, Lord, your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you, God, for your mercy, uh, Lord, to touch our lives, to, to save our soul. And so, Lord, may you stir us up, uh, even as our brother Alan and, and Kay, uh, to, Lord, to want to see the, the scriptures go forth, uh, to see your word do that uh, life-changing work in other souls. Uh, Lord, may you stir us up to share our friend Jesus with uh, those who have yet to meet him. Uh, Lord, so may you use us as you see fit. Uh, thank you, God, for uh, blessing us with the word this day. Uh, Lord, may we walk with you um, in faith this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.